All right, everybody. So our next uh, next panel here is uh, going to be led by Kim Nichols, and Kim is a 25-year veteran of the kind of finance side of things, and uh, she's been working really intently in the giant screen world for about the last 10 years. Um, and her background again is really on the finance side, and that's what this session is going to focus on. This part of the uh, pre-production part of our process. So anatomy of a giant screen, and again, I'm gonna just be brief and turn this over to Kim, and we'll get this piece rolling. So, Kim. Thank you, Christian, and it's great to see so many people here. Um, we're gonna be talking about the anatomy of a giant screen budget, and I'd first like to introduce you to the other people uh, on stage with me. We have two people who are currently um, producing and working on some wonderful things that you hopefully will have seen some of um, if you were here on Monday. Uh, we have Jen Casey, and Jen is uh, Jen has been working in both TV and giant screen, so she has a very diverse background in a number of different areas. Um, she worked on, uh, she's a producer, she worked on Tornado Alley, I know many of you have seen that. She's currently working on both Extreme Weather and Soar, again those would have both been something you would have seen on Monday. Um, production there looks great on both of those. And then we have Greg Eliason. Greg Eliason is a line producer with a number of credits to his name, including Mummies, Forces of Nature, and currently he's working on Voyage of Time and Cuba. So please help me welcome my esteemed panelists. <laughs> So the three things that we're gonna to do today, um, I am gonna walk you through the results of a survey that we did of Giant Screen Cinema Association member producers related to budgets. And then Greg, with the help of Jen, is gonna take you through the budgeting process for the uh, fictitious film, Slugs 3D, that's the working title. And finally then, Jen is gonna do a walkthrough of the top sheet budget for her current production, Soar. So to get started. So we did a survey, it was a fairly quick survey, um, and the reason we really did this was it can be hard to get actual budget numbers for films. Um, not a lot of people want to release that information, it is very sensitive, and we felt that maybe if we surveyed producers uh, anonymously, didn't ask for film titles, didn't ask for their names, that we could maybe get some, some data and at least get some averages and ranges put together to give give everybody just an idea of what it costs to make a giant screen film today. Um, so we did a formal survey of giant screen Cinema Association member producers on films that they have made in the last five years and also anything they currently have in production. And then in addition, I did some inquiries of various people regarding the correlation between budget and uh, attendance or success of a film. So we're gonna walk through the results of that. You're going to see they're varied, is the word I'm going to use. So the survey had seven questions, um, five of which are basically number related, and the other two are going to be more of a free form answer kind of uh, scenario. So starting out, the first question is, what was the budget for any film you've had in the last five years or currently in production? And the range here is pretty grand. Um, 500,000 to eight and a half million was the range. I know many of you are probably groaning about the $500,000 end. That is not the norm, I will tell you that. Um, the majority of them are in the four to six million dollar range. And then I also know that there's talk of some films that have been in, in excess of $10 million. We talk about that fairly regularly in this group. Um, they did not make the survey, so they're not within what I'm presenting here, but I know we, we do talk about that. Um, then we had the budgets broken down into the major components to get an idea. We didn't ask people to provide numbers. Again, we know that they're very sensitive, um, some of these numbers are. But we wanted to get kind of an idea at least of what percentages of the budgets go into the bigger pieces. So the first one we asked about was above the line costs. And we, we did spell out what the general consensus is for what that consists of. That being the producer, director, narrator, writer, script development, and research. Those were the things that we, um, as a group, agreed would go into that above the line cost. On average, that is about 20% of a film budget. 
Uh, next, we had production costs. Those are the, that's the biggest piece. Uh, that is about 40 to 45 percent. And then post-production costs comprising about 30 percent. Now, you can see that doesn't add up to 100. There are a few other smaller items in there, insurance, contingency, those kind of things. But generally speaking, these are the biggest things. Next question we asked was um, P&A costs. What do they range? Um, and any, and we, we, we provided a chance for people to make comments on these as well. Um, so those are ranging from about 90,000 to two and a half million dollars. And keep in mind that that can be handled in different ways. It can either be covered entirely by the film budget, it can be covered entirely by the distributor, or some combination. For example, um, you could have the deliverables covered in the film budget, the advertising paid by the distributor. So in many cases, this is above and beyond the 500000 to $8.5 million budget that um, people were working with. Then we have the big two questions. Um, the first one of which is, do you feel that there is a direct correlation between budget and success of a film? That was a yes or no question, and then it was a why or why not that followed that. Um, I'm going to say it was split about 50-50 on that one. Um, some producers were extremely adamant that big budgets were necessary to make a film with high enough quality to look good on the giant screen. Others were adamant there is no co correlation whatsoever. And then there's a number of people in the gray area, in the it depends area. Um, so like I said, we, we asked not only the yes or no question, but also, why or not? So I've, there were some very similar responses, so I've tried to summarize those here. Um, while it does help to have a large budget, that doesn't necessarily the mean, the, mean the movie is going to succeed and vice versa. History has proven this. There's a two and a half million dollar film, let's say, that has generated three times the attendance of one that costs three times as much to make. And there are more examples of far more extremes on either end than that one. Um, giant screen is an expensive format, and there is likely a minimum spend that is required to achieve the quality needed. Uh, but success can also be driven by subject matter and other films competing for market share, other films that are coming out at the same time with a similar subject matter. Then the last question we asked, and this is a fairly loaded question as well, and that I think is one that everybody's talking about these days, how can producers keep costs down but bring the quality up? Uh, there were some very, very lengthy responses to this question, which um, some things have words I can't repeat in them. Not up here anyway, maybe at the bar later. Um, but I tried to briefly list them out here to give everyone an idea of, of what the producers are thinking, because this, this is a huge issue. Um, so you can see them listed there. Good scripts that are executed for the giant screen. Not repurposing something that is made for TV shooting on 65 millimeter film, keeping the digital capture over 6K raw in 2D or 3D, understand the medium you're working in. This is the one that generated the longest response, I will, I will let you know. Have theaters and distributors give a higher percentage back to the producers? Uh-huh. <laughs> Adopt innovation, innovative use of technology, and then improve the production and post-production processes. Now, some of those are very specific. Some of those are a lot more broad answers. But I think some very good information um, through the survey. So that is really what I wanted to present to you guys. We are going to have a Q&A at the end for all three of us. Um, and one thing I'm going to remind you of before I sit down is if you do have questions, please make sure you use the microphones, or I can repeat them. We are recording this session to be available on the website at any time afterwards, so we want to be able to capture people's questions as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Greg Eliason to go through Slugs 3D with you. Hi, everyone. So um, <clears throat> yeah, what's this movie going to cost anyway? That's the question, right? Uh, and that's usually kind of where I come into the process. Um, uh, and that's an interesting question. Maybe it's just because this is the kind of work I have to do. Maybe it's only interesting to me. But I guess since you're sitting here, I'm going to assume it's sort of interesting to you. Um, so it, 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 as these guys have alluded, it's, you know, we can't discuss real numbers. Um, and we shouldn't, even if we could. Um, so uh, I'm gonna, I, I've made up a project. I've made up Slugs 3D. Hopefully no one's making a slug movie. Any, anybody making a slug movie? 
<laughs> Nobody? Nobody? My, okay, James is making a one. Yeah, we're in, we're in competition for, I know, it's, it's shocking. Anyway, so we're, uh, uh, so th this is, this is going to be a, a little exercise where, where we're going to imagine that someone has come to me with a project called Slugs 3D, and I'm going to create a budget for it, and then I'm going to walk through, walk through that process and that budget f with you briefly uh, to see how, how much it would cost to make in theory. But before I start, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, um, I'm not, you know, there's a lot of expertise in this room, and I'm not trying to stand up here and say I'm the only guy who, you know, I'm not. Uh, I, I have a lot of respect for the producers here, and this is always a conversation. It's, it's not a process where someone says, how much is this going to cost? And I'd say, this is what it's going to cost. It's, it's a conversation, and I'm hoping to illustrate that today. <clears throat> um, and the other thing is, is that as soon as you start asking what something costs, um, you immediately get into a, a kind of a complex internal conversation. Because if you say to me, you know, how much does the camera cost? Then we, I have to say, well, what camera is it going to be? And then you have to say, well, what's the shot going to be? Then we have to talk about what's the movie going to be like. So immediately, every single question really goes to the sort of bigger picture of the entire film. Every little bit, the camera, the post-production process that you're going to use, the size of the film, who you're going to hire as your DP. That's all, those are all kind of artistic, philosophical, big picture questions that get decided at the beginning, but um, those infuse every decision that you make throughout the entire process. So, you know, as I, as I tried to create a budget, um, it's very hard to make generalities about this. So here's some movies that I've worked on. There's a little odd little glitch in there, a couple of them. Hmm, how strange. So Alaska mummies right around the world, which you can't read there. Voyage of Time, Rivers of Life, Wired to Win, Force of Nature. There's a lot of movies that I've worked on. You couldn't make generalizations between these. If I showed you the budgets for all of them, they wouldn't have anything to do with your movie or with Slugs 3D, my new soon-to-be blockbuster. <laughs> so, you know, how, how do we make generalizations? Uh, it, to be perfectly honest, I, you know, you can't. So, so we may, I'm making this movie, Extreme Slugs. It's going to be awesome. Okay, so... Um, so how does the conversation start? Well, first of all, if somebody comes to me with a script or an idea or a treatment, at some, at some level of detail, the more I know about the exact process, the more I know about the movie that you're trying to make, the more accurately I, ca I can budget. And I'll try to come back to this later, but um, it's much easier to get the budget down when I know more about the project. Um, people, always, of course, producers always want to get the budget down, but if the project is very vague, one can't be certain about being able to achieve a vague idea. One can be certain about being able to achieve a specific idea. Maybe you all know that. Um, so the budget comes in, or excuse me, the idea, the script comes in, and then we start to talk about the project parameters and assumptions. This is where this meeting is going to get really sexy. So first we talk about scope. How big is it? Um, and this is again is a philosophical question, you know. Um, Kim was just saying that these budgets range from, in her survey, 8.5 million to 500,000. I've never worked on a $500,000 film uh, for large format, but I've worked on uh, a big range of films. And, you know, these, I guess the question is, you know, does my budget correlate with quality? That, that's a, an unanswerable question. Um, but I, I, you have to tell me, or, or one has to decide up front, what's it going to be? How, how, you know, who's going to shoot it? Who's the narrator going to be? Who's the director going to be? Are you going to be willing to go to multiple international locations, or are you going to try and shoot it primarily domestically, and so on and so forth? Distributor distribution platforms, I'm not going to go through that. I think you guys understand what that means. But those things, that, that you have to begin with the end in mind. If you don't know how you're going to distribute the movie, it's impossible to make budget assumptions from the beginning. If you're, if you're assuming that you're going to make 1570 3D prints, I guess that's a rarity now, if not, uh, if not, well, I, I guess it's a rarity at this point. But one must decide at this stage what, you know, how far one's going to go in order to make sure that you're producing your material at a level of quality that's going to make sense. 
2D or 3D, obviously. Native 2D versus, excuse me, native 3D versus 3D conversion. Um, things are changing there too, quick. What does that mean? How, you know, what, what does it mean to, to your uh, distribution plan? What does it mean to the theaters? Um, does, it, does it have a financial implication to your project? It certainly has an artistic uh, implication. And again, does it have a philosophical implication? Forgive me for being, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about this philosophy of it, and that may, maybe sounds uh, overblown, but you have to decide. Are you going to try to make a film that's uh, 1570 origination? Do you care about that? Does your audience care? So 1570 capture versus digital, that's that discussion. The scope of the CG, how many minutes, how complex. The major players and above the line costs, above the line, as Kim was talking about, it's the you know, director, producer, talent. Whether you're gonna have union affiliations. What tax incentives and rebates, like Jonathan and the previous panel were talking about. Your NS, NSF grant, production bond. All these major decisions have to get decided up front, and then you move on to actually starting to put numbers together. The next part of the budget process, for me, uh, I always ask these questions of the producer, you know, you have to assume that you're, you're trying to achieve, well, if you say, what's this going to cost? What's Slug's 3D going to cost? I'm going to create a budget based on those previous assumptions, and I'm going to say, I believe that it's achievable for this amount of money. I feel confident. Because once you make a budget, you have to live with the budget, right? You can't just say, it's going to cost two million bucks, and just hope that you're going to be able to figure out a way to make it work. You have to be confident that what you've planned is actually going to work. So that's the first version, achievable for X amount. The second one is backed up with hard numbers. This is the way that uh, the Disney people like to do their budgets, where you actually have to get um, specific hard data for every line item in the budget. So if you have a truck in your budget, here's you know, the uh, estimate. Here's the company that we'd be renting the truck from. Here's how much it's going to cost. Here's how much the DP is going to cost. Here's a deal memo supporting that. That's a very, very time-consuming and expensive process to create a budget like that. That's how some people like to do it. Um, and w at the end of it, you have a budget that's extremely inflexible. Because if you have overages for weather, if you have overages for you name it, um, it doesn't reflect that. A budget that I think is achievable for, for X amount, I'm always assuming, you know, we're going to film for Slugs 3D. Of course, we have to film in Ghana because there's giant snails there. You guys all knew that, right? <laughs> so we're going to go to Ghana. <laughs> And, uh, but you know, the weather's crummy in Ghana, or the political situation is crummy in Ghana, or whatever it is, you know. In Cuba, we're working, I'm working on the Cuba film. It's complicated to film in Cuba, you know. How do you put it's complicated in your budget? Well, you just have to know, okay, these, th these, this number of weeks, in my mind, I've already thought, okay, it's complicated. I'm gonna assume it's not gonna be a week. It's not gonna be four days. And then the last version is hit the number. This is very common. <laughs> Excuse me. Everybody, everybody wants because look, producers have a, a, a they have a job to do. They got to find the money and they got to get the movie made. A producer uh, who is at this conference once said to me, you know, he said at some point you say to yourself, amazingly, we've got this much money to make the movie. Amazingly, someone gave us this much money. Now, how are we? What are, now? What are we going to do? Because ultimately, everything up to that point doesn't really matter. You know, once you've got the actual number of dollars in the bank account, then you can make that movie. You know, your fantasy number. Who knows? You know, so hit the number means this is the amount of money this budget needs to be, because this is what we can get, or this is what we got. So make that work. What movie can we do with that? So for Slugs 3D, I'm assuming it's a 3D 44-minute final film. I, I'm going to show you a couple versions of this as if, as if I'm having a conversation with you all. Um, so in version number one, it's 3D, it's 44 minutes. We're originating 30% native 3D, 40% 2D macro and 2D material for conversion, 20% 1570 2D, aerials, 10% CGI. We're going to attempt to get an NSF grant. It's a non-union project. I mean, I'm not going to go through every single assumption because it's a complex thing, but you, you, just so you understand, this is my first step. This is the first step, is you make a series of assumptions that allow you to create a budget that's based on that. And that way, when you're having this conversation with everybody, we know, well, look, Greg, it can't, it can't be a non-union job because of blank reason. You know, We're not going to get an NSF grant because 
the NSF hates slugs, or you know, we've decided to put, I don't know what, in the movie, what would, why wouldn't the NSF like a slug movie? I don't know. It's six weeks of, 16 weeks of shooting. I'm gonna be shooting in Los Angeles. Of course, like I said, gone, I have to go there. Brazil. I mean, again, I'm just making this stuff up, but as you, as you are creating a project, of course, all these things are gonna change entirely. And this, this conversation, this budget conversation, in other words, if I say, if, if my budget comes back and I'm trying to do the first version, in this version I'm saying I'm gonna create a budget which I believe is executable for X amount, um, shortly we're gonna see that, no, we can't go to Ghana, tragically. We're never gonna see the giant snails. They really exist. Okay, so let's uh, jump out of this and uh, we're gonna talk about the budget itself for a minute. Okay, so we might as well go to the end, right? Everybody wants to know the total. Whoever actually looks at a budget, nobody ever actually looks at it. All they look at is the total, 8.5. There, that's the answer. How much does the slugs 3D cost? 8.5, 8.5 million. Everybody knows that. <laughs> How, why? So let's chat about it. Development, I mean, we can, look, I, I could talk to you about this for a long time and it would be even more boring than what I'm doing now. <laughs> um, so, you know, if, if there's specifics you wanna chat about, we can do that. But, you know, essentially, what th this particular budget, um, this is a, a budget called Movie Magic, uh, Movie Magic, rather, so we can jump up and down in these budget categories and look at specifics uh, in the, in the minutiae. But here I'm imagining that we're gonna develop the project that's gonna cost 250 grand, and SF grant's gonna, gonna cost 100 grand, 50 grand for a writer, five grand for research. The producers get 250 grand. The line producers 180. And so on down the line. That's the producer's unit total. The director is a flat fee of 200 grand. Now look. Can you find a director that will cost 300 grand? Or 100 grand? Or zero dollars? Of course you can. So you have to, you know, you know this is a conversation. I, I don't know who the director of this movie is. Or maybe you've told me and, and we know what their, what their deal is and I can put it in, I'll, I'll know the answer. You know, again, grips, it's, it's, a, it's a funny question. How, how do you budget for a movie that, in my imagination for this movie, there's just a treatment, it's two pages long. There's slugs in different places, we're gonna film them. How, do, how many grips do we need for that? I'm gonna assume very few, but you know, uh, one must make a, d a decision, and that's based on my own little mental calculations about what I think, not really ab about anything having to do with anything. I mean, <laughs> yeah, so lighting, I'm gonna assume we're gonna be doing a bunch of, uh, a bunch of macro work, so therefore we need uh, to have a macro set, we're gonna have to light it, and so on. This is the camera department. It's, this is usually a pretty expensive item. This is a $1 million budget line item, this camera operations department. But that's because we're assuming that we're shooting macro work. We're assuming that we're, sh we're shooting some 3D. We're assuming, we're assuming that we have uh, IMAX trained assistant camera people. They're, they're not inexpensive. The DP is not inexpensive. But again, if you went, if you went, if you took my, if you just took a picture of this, or if you, if I, I'm not gonna give this budget out because I don't think it's valuable, but if you took it as your starting point, you'd be in a funny position because, again, you have to make your decisions based on reality for your own project. So unless you're making a slug movie, I don't think, it's, you know, mm -hmm. that makes sense? All right. So we go on down the line. Big, big ticket items are always um, the location department. And we spend a ton of money on airfares going all over the world, on housing people, it's always cost a fortune. Film production lab, we're gonna shoot some 1570 for this movie. There's a boat unit, because we have to shoot, you know, sea slugs, come on. There's an aerial unit. Flying, there's a flying, that's right. There's, there is a, there is a, never mind, I'm not gonna, I accidentally couldn't help myself, I did some slug research, and I was gonna, I was gonna show you a bunch of slug pictures, but I thought, this is too silly, I'm not gonna do it. There's a flying slug. It's an underwater slug, it flies through the water. It's very, very strange, it's recently discovered. Cutting edge slug research brought to you by, anyway, so VFX, that's just a big fat number, a million bucks. We're gonna see that in the next version, it's not so much. I don't know, I don't know how much VFX we're doing for this movie, so I'm, I'm, you know, this is not based on a quote, right? But if, you know, if, you, if we said to ourselves, okay, well, we have these 
you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have the rise of the mollusks sequence in this movie. So for the rise of the mollusks sequence, you know, how many minutes is that gonna be? How, how complex is it gonna be? Are we gonna have to shoot plates and so on and so forth? If I had real numbers about the rise of the, uh, real uh, assumptions about numbers of minutes for the rise of the mollusks sequence, I love saying that, um, then I'd, I'd be able to tell you more about VFX, but we're just gonna plop in a big number and then later we're gonna hack that number away because we don't really know. I don't know if it's worthwhile to continue to go through this. There's a couple of more uh, fairly big ticket item, items here. Um, the 3D conversion is a big chunk of money. It's nice to keep that, well, for myself, again, I, I don't want to, to, okay, now I'm gonna reveal something about this job. The guy, the guy who has to do this job, he's in a panic, me or someone like me, is in a panic that he's gonna give you a budget that he's not gonna be able to get, make the movie for, right? So. I, I, my motivation is to keep this number up, quite frankly. Not that I want to pay, overpay, but I'm concerned that if I tell you I can make this movie for three million bucks, that you're going to come back and say, okay, let's go. And then I'm, holy cow, the plane tickets are three times as much as I thought they were going to be, and you want to hire this DP who costs three times as much as what I budgeted, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, it's in my best interest to make sure that it's doable for this number, if I say it is. And then we have things like the production company fee here. You know, it's 8%. That's a big whopping 600 grand there. That's not going to stay. Right? That's going to get argued about. Because people that are investing their money in this movie are going to look at that number and say, wait a minute. You know, so that, that, that money might evaporate, it might get cut, and it might filter its way throughout the rest of the budget. I mean, this is sausage making, right? It's, it's not necessarily the most beautiful process. So let's look at the, another version of this. Let's imagine now that you've told me eight million, eight and a half million bucks, no way. 6.4, Greg. That's what you gotta do it for. That's what we got. This particular budget allows us to, uh, allows us to look at uh, the comparison. Am I seeing this up here? No, it's not in the show. There it is. It allows us to look at the variance from our previous version. So basically, if you tell me we gotta do this for 6.4, I'm just gonna start hacking away at everything I can possibly find in this thing that I might have left a little bit of fat in, or a lot of fat in. Can't really see this, how, how can I make this look prettier? I'll have, to, I'll have to click back and forth from the side. So, you know, we took from our 350 grand, we cut out 50 grand. Well, why was that extra 50 grand in there to begin with? Well, you know, these movies take a long time to make, so I'm making assumptions about what I think is going to cost, or sometimes in this case, you know, the producers may tell me, look, we need 350 grand in this, in this uh, development budget because we've been working on this movie for so long and we've already spent it. That, mo that money's gone. But, you know, our writer is going to be cheaper now. We're going to take five grand away from him. Our director is going to be cheaper. We're going to take 50 grand away from him. And so on. Now, how do I make these assumptions? Again, I feel like the logical conclusion to this can be the $500,000 budget, but that's, you'll drive yourself in, into, the, you'll, you'll go crazy if you do that, if you try to do that. If you just hack away at every single budget line item, you know. I mean, w one needs cameras, one needs hotel rooms if one is not in one's city. So, uh, I'm sorry, for some reason I'm, it's not allowing me to be wide enough for this, for you to see both sides of this, unfortunately. But, So for, for set operations here, you know, we cut out 96,000 bucks there. And then we find ourselves slowly but surely winnowing down everything from the tests, the CG gets a big hit because we're gonna pull out $176,000 because we've made different set of assumptions here. I'm not gonna bother to show you the whole list of assumptions because now the movie is shorter, there's less CG, the, the 3D conversion is fewer number of minutes and so on and so forth. So eventually we get that number all the way down to 6.4. So that's really the end of my, uh, of my discussion. I'm happy to talk about this. I'm ha happy to talk about details about it if you want. You know, many of these things are made up because this is a made up movie, but um, that's as close as I can get to talking about a budget with you because I can't talk about a real budget with you because that's what Jen's <laughs> gonna do. 
<clears throat> okay. Jen? Yeah. I'm going to do it from here, if that's okay. You're going to do it from there? Yeah. Oh. Do you want me to put this up? Okay. Is this? You, you're yeah. going to have to scroll this a little bit, but because um, they can't see it all. Okay. So I'm going to echo what Greg said. Um, I see a lot of people in the room who have way more experience uh, with line producing and pr pr producing several films and having several different um, uh, situations to work with. But I am currently producing two films, and I'm going to talk about the one that is earlier in the process. And so it pertains more to, I think, what we're talking about, and that's SOAR, which hopefully you saw in films and production, was it two days ago? Two days ago. Um, and I'm not a line producer. I'm a producer. Um, so actually, with this uh, first draft of our SOAR budget, I uh, worked with Greg to, and Rick and I worked with Greg to come up with these starting numbers. So my background originally is theater. So I'm used to working with low budgets, sadly. <laughs> so I feel like um, what I bring to these productions, you know, SOAR, is that I'm creative at, you know, varied types of situations uh, in funding. And so I think you can make a great film for not a great amount of money. But I also think that if you're given more money as the production moves forward, it's not going to hurt. It's only going to allow you to do things you know, on a grander scale, I guess. So um, when I first got approached about producing SOAR, I was really excited because all my giant screen uh, experience has been with films that surround around weather, and weather is probably the least controllable element you could possibly be trying to produce, right? I mean, you cannot tell it to be, you know, ready for your shoot and make sure it does what it's supposed to do. So I was like, okay, this is, this is about, you know, soaring and gliders, and, and this won't be, you know, an additional thing you have to deal with in this film. But sure enough, it's a huge component of gliding, and so... It is, in essence, ha it has a big weather component. So that is, of course, going to be a factor in the budget as the production moves forward. Um, this budget that you're going to see is a starting point. This is not going to be where we end up. And so we had to start somewhere and kind of, like Greg said, start creating our parameters of what we felt we needed to make this film happen. And uh, so that's why, you know, Rick and I felt okay to share this budget because this is not for a budget that's been completed and this is what it ended up with. And, and so for now, this is where we started and we'll go up and down, hopefully up and, you know, maybe down in, with these numbers as we, you know, get into the, the nitty gritty of, of producing the film. So, Looking at the numbers that we created for this starting template for our film and looking at the survey results, we do fall into those parameters of what pre-production or above the line, po uh, post-production and production costs percentage-wise. We're pretty close, actually, to the average that you got from the survey. So that was interesting to see for me. Um, I think our pre-production, if you look at it, is pretty general. And this is obviously just a, a top sheet budget where I'm not going into the line items beyond what you see. But generally, I think we're pretty standard for pre-production costs. On the lower end, but still pretty standard. Where I think that SOAR specifically um, has situations, like Greg said, with Slugs 3D that uh, depend on the situation is you know, for the production part of it, there's certain things that different producers or directors will bring to the table that can help defer the costs of your budget. Like, you know, Sean and I happen to own a lot of equipment, so that helps with equipment costs. Um, you know, we were able to film, you know, a good percentage of the movie by self-funding, um, and so that is going to defray a lot of production costs for us. 
It kind of depends on your situation in your movie, as Greg said. But for SOAR, that's been the case. And then for POST, um, as everyone knows, I think, the post-production world is changing so fast that what you budget here might not be the costs or the way you're going to you know, uh, do your post once you get to the post-production part of your movie. So it is really difficult when you're budgeting to know, OK, when we're done 18 months from now, what will the post cost be? So that's kind of, to me, the one that I feel like is the hardest to nail down numbers for. And for specifically for SOAR, when you have Rick Gordon as one of your producers, it, he's such an expert in post-production that you know that that's going to be a leg up for you in keeping track as soon as things happen in post-production to staying current with what your costs are going to be as they change. So that, to me, is, uh, was very helpful and I felt like um, at least we'll know as they happen. We won't come to post-production and then suddenly find out things we didn't know when we made it, the budget you know, 18 months before. So you can see our biggest cost in this is the post of the picture, which is probably not surprising. And I think that's something that uh, if you are a new producer to Giant Screen, you definitely need to know that a lot of your big ticket items will be in the post picture. Um, and I don't think that's new information for anybody, but I just thought I would mention on our budget, it holds true. So that's source current budget, and it'll change. Um, but I just thought it would be a good template to start from so you can see, OK, with these parameters, this is where we started, like Greg said. And then you adjust every single step of the way as things happen or change. I'm going to ask both of you guys to maybe talk a little bit about what items are in a budget that are unique to filming for the giant screen as compared to another medium. You want to start? Go for it. <laughs> um, uh, specific things that are unique. Um, well, you know, there, look, if, if you looked at the budget for um, for Batman versus Superman, well, I guess that's that's a, also a giant screen film. Um, if you, I, my short answer is, is it, there's not really anything. But but um, you know we do things in a certain way that are not necessarily what are expected in other formats. So I guess really ultimately it's a it's a question of um, the the cameras specifically the crew specifically who knows how to a acquire this material in a way that's going to be acceptable and then the post has to uh, has to come in. I mean, we, we've all seen moments in films where the film is struggling, where the film, the, the footage is not holding up. And avoiding that is every, in everyone's best interest, obviously. So how does one achieve that? That's the main thing. You know, how, how can I answer that very specifically? It's not, a, it's not a one sentence answer. It's throughout the entire project, how do you approach the question of gear, crew, um, you know, number of weeks on location, post-production, you know, the quality of your post-production, the quality of your 3D uh, conversion if you do it, all those things. So uh, it's almost nothing and everything at the same time. How's that for a great answer? You're welcome. <laughs> Jen? <laughs> yeah, I would echo what you say and also say to me it seems like maybe the, you know, the above-the-line costs in other formats can be a lot bigger percentage, obviously. And um, for giant screen, you know, you're going to have costs and posts that you might not encounter in other formats. Yeah, I'm going to add one more thing to that, which is that, you know, often giant screen shooting is very scrappy. I mean, I spent months and scrappy. months with Sean in a van trying to, f when we were filming For Forces of Nature, two guys in a van with a camera. That was the crew. <laughs> um, so, you know, how do you anticipate that kind of a budget? It's hard because on some level, you're, you know, we, we were shooting with the W4. We were shooting a 1570 original material. So every shot we shot was a very expensive shot. We didn't shoot very much because we were looking for weather that wasn't happening and that was the, that was the cost, you know, crummy hotel rooms and gas. Um, 
so we didn't have, uh, an, you know, a, the above the line costs were not spectacularly high, but the, the camera gear, the film costs were totally different. So it, it, it's hard to give a simple answer to that question, I'm sorry. I wasn't looking for something else. Right. <laughs> so anything else you want to talk about before we open it up for questions? No. Okay, questions. I'm going to let you start since you're closest to the microphone. <laughs> Hi. I was just wondering, um, uh, well, to, the, uh, to you guys and to the um, uh, panelists from before, uh, the sort of teasers that are shot for, you know, pitches to various funding organizations, are those, do those need to be on, on 1570, you know, yeah. The teaser, I, well. You mean to, uh, when you're pitching your film to, to partner with someone, you mean? How about kind of? Is that an answer? I mean, sure, you know, why not? I mean, look, the, again, the people that you're trying to impress, you want them to be impressed with the material you're bringing them, you know? So that teaser reel that you're shooting should be, it should be the best of the, of the best kind of footage that you're gonna get. So it should floor everybody. If it doesn't do that, then you're just hurting yourself. So I would say, as much as possible, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, this is just my own opinion because I do a lot of teasers for television as well is, you know, it's a sales tape. And so you have to think of it as such. You have to think of, you know, what would I want to buy as the buyer if you think of them as your partner as a buyer? You know, what is going to appeal to them? And as much knowledge as you can bring to it too, you know, how is this framed? What is the pacing of this? What is the subject matter and how am I showing that it could be it could last for a 40 minute, you know, not a feature, but a short. I mean, you have to think of all those things, but realize that you're trying to sell not only your subject matter, but the content and how you're telling it, and also, you know, the resolution. And if you can't afford to shoot it in the resolution, I don't think anybody is going to say, well, we can't fix that problem. I think they, they will, but you have to kind of bring ideas of how you would shoot it if you did have the funding to shoot it in the resolution that it needs to be shot in. A uh, quick follow-up. So is, is, a, is a useful approach to almost think of your material for your teaser as like a test shoot? You know, I saw some of films in production that seem to have that attitude on Monday. Um, yeah, just kind of... I think they're both viable and I think it probably depends on the format you're trying to shoot it in ultimately or what you'd like to shoot it in ultimately um, and it also is the subject matter. If the subject matter is dependent really heavily on the story you're telling within that subject matter then you're going to have to show some sort of story arc or back it up obviously with written material that's very clear. <coughs> And if you're showing more the, the world and, and how incredibly visual this world is, and maybe there's one or two or three different ways you could go with story, then I think that test shoots are fantastic. I have a uh, post-production line item question, which is uh, 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 shooting at the film, making a film print. Is how necessary is that still? How many uh, uh, film theaters are there left? Um, um, it's Because it's a big line item, right? Um, and it, can, can we make a successful f film essentially that's digital only now? And is this going to create a uh, flat dome split? I'm not going to weigh in on that. But um, I think that... You're, you're not, which part? You're not going to weigh in on the f flat dome split? I don't think I'm qualified to mm. weigh in on that. But Rob it's a qualified. very... It's a Rob very... To this question. Okay, good. I think it's a very great question. And um, I think that... Well, someone else Yeah, I mean, at this point, I think I think uh, I don't think people are are still striking 3D uh, film prints necessarily. How, how many 3D film prints are you striking for? Uh, if you want to have the California Science Center, you got to strike 3D film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you guys hear what Di said? She said, "From the IMAX Film Fund, they wouldn't approve a budget unless it had a, a 3D." 
print. I mean, I, I've and never. That's being, yeah. And that's being carried by the production. That's a deliverable by the production. I've never worked on a film that wasn't going to have a film print. That's all I can say. Question here um, on the films in development, films in production, uh, the trailers. I'm seeing an increasing amount of shots, shot with sub thousand dollar cameras, GoPros, Lumix, and things like that. We see that they're very conspicuous in a lot of the shots we see on the screen. So my question to you as line producer and producers, do you see that percentage uh, stabilizing, increasing, uh, versus what you say should be our minimum, which is uh, 6K and above. So is that trend rising uh, in what you see as works in production right now? I can only speak to the films that I'm working on, so I don't think I have a wide enough breadth of, of all the films in production or development. Um, I think they have their use for sure, and, and SOAR does use those. Um, would we feel better if we could shoot everything 6K or above? Yeah. So it's, I guess it's a, a balancing act, but I have no idea where it's going to go from here, um, which kind of speaks to the point I was trying to make about post. When you're making a budget and you have one idea of what your post is going to be and you get there and it's a little different, um, you know, we're living in a time where things are changeable and, and you have to kind of prepare for not knowing what's, what it's going to be two years out. Yeah, I mean, you know, Red is coming out with, out with the 8K weapon now. Um, I, and I think that that's an ongoing, this is an ongoing struggle I think we've been seeing in the format for a long time. I think, I mean, it was a long time ago. I, I'm going to quote Sean Phillips. He said, uh, you know, I'll tell you exactly the moment that we're going to go digital, when it's better and cheaper, both. When it's cheaper, some people start going with digital. And when it's better, if it's better and more expensive, some people will go with digital. But when it's both, it's going to happen quick. When, when that happens, when that happens. I want to try and address this um, from the perspective of our technical committee. So we have a document that was created over the last couple of years called the post-production and post-production workflow. We have copies here that there's enough for everybody in the room. Um, we are pushing for technical standards in giant screen that are the highest resolutions possible. GoPro or small cameras like that are appropriate for tiny insert shots, but I think it is very, I am extremely comfortable in saying that 6K and above is really minimum resolution for our films. Um, and it's absolutely the case that if you're budgeting for a giant screen film, you have to budget for print. You still do, because dome is an absolutely critical part of our market, um, as is the, the still remaining uh, 3D and 2D flat screens. So these are multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars that have to be in the budget. Um, and I, I think if you're thinking about producing in some low resolution format, this just isn't the, the place. Um, we, our business has been built on 1570, the absolute highest resolution film format on earth. And as we transition to digital, it is critical that we maintain absolutely top level standards of resolution. And little insert, yeah, it works like, you know, Stephen Lowe is using that very appropriately as cockpit. There's no other way to get that shot. So as a storyteller, sure, using camera very sparingly works. But for budgeting and for the general production of giant screen films, 
we are a super high resolution format. And the, the critical element, you'll see this in our technical documents, you really have to appreciate that in the budgeting process, you have to consider the entire workflow. And when you make a camera choice to get the ultimate resolution, you have to make very careful choices all the way through the post-production process to make sure that you're not in what we would call a destructive workflow, where you're losing resolution. Um, so how the camera is set up when you shoot it, watching those ones and zeros all the way through to the deliverable process is critical, but I really want to make people, I want to be very clear here, if you're a new filmmaker, you can't skimp on resolution in this format. So I just wanted to be clear about that and come get a copy of the P3W workflow and we'll... I want to get that, but I have a question for you. What is the uh, aspect ratio of, in pixels of 1570? Well, I, I might defer to some of the more technical people in the room. Maybe, do you, you want to take that? It, it's really, I mean, we're talking about, we're, we're a, basically a square format when you look at our mm -hmm. screen. Mm -hmm. So it's 189 uh, is kind of the traditional there. Andrew, would you want to answer that? 4K is 4096 pixels wide, and the height, is, it's, it goes out to film as 4 by 3, so it's 3072 pixels high. Mm -hmm. that, okay. That's when you do a 4 by 3 film out. Um, your 4K master would still have that 4096 pixel wide count. But that's not what he's asking. He was asking what if you shoot IMAX 15 per 7, correct? Yeah. What it is, what's the equivalent? What, I, what I'm doing is I'm. Uh, Now let's say that I accumulate uh, about 20 photos, okay, and I want to do a Ken Burns type of effect, and they are huge. I mean, they're like 48 inches by 38 inches wide, right? What kind of software program can I use to edit that into an IMAX format? Is there is it an Avid or Final Cut Pro or? Okay, so while well, I've got a lot of studying to do, and, and you're a, uh, okay, that report there, I'm going to go get one. Okay, thanks. I'm going to shift the tone a little bit, if I may. That was all tremendously good information, but, and I think we've already had a response from our temporary panelists, but it, to, to new filmmakers, what would be the, you know, the best advice you think you could offer to avoid the surprise? that you started with a budget, you didn't finish there. Well, my biggest advice was covered in the last session, but it would be to really study and meet people within the industry that have this information and can give you as much information at the start as possible. And you, to me, that's you don't skimp on studying the industry, studying its specifics and really talking at length with people who have a lot of experience in, in this specific industry. Yeah, I, I agree. Partnering with somebody who's been through it, because it, unless you've been all the way to the end before, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot to it. So, you know, being there, going through the process, especially the post process with people who've done it, it's uh, pretty critical. Any other questions? And I'm also going to open this up. I know I don't think Paul Fraser's panelists are still in the room, but I know he didn't have any time for Q&A. And if, I don't know if anybody had any questions they wanted to, to ask of him. We do have a few minutes before lunch, so I thought I'd open that up as well. I have one more question. 
Sure. Uh, if I shot something in, in uh, 8th Street, 1920 by 1080, what is the problem about blowing it up? It looks lousy. It's what? <laughs> it looks lousy. <laughs> It just doesn't have the, enough resolution. To, I mean, you can panel it like they're saying, you know, like uh, you, you've seen in a variety of the films if you've been watching them. But you can do an insert shot with that, and it'll, it'll sustain, you know, at a certain portion of the screen. But when you blow it all the way up, typically speaking, almost always those shots look lousy. All right. Thanks. Um, this, this may be covered again in a more technical panel, but uh, just wondering about sort of. Uh, the DRM process that is sort of applied to like Hollywood films, how much, how much that, you know, minimum resolutions for that to actually be kind of good. And how much it's used in, in some of these uh, documentary programs. Yeah, yeah that's, I, I'm re I would really defer to the tech folks on that. I mean, I, that's, a, that's not my area of expertise. We are going to get into technical stuff in great detail tomorrow. Yeah. So. Great. Hey there. Um, curious about if you can share typical, typically um, in your experience, what percentage of your budget is uh, of your film is financed before you actually enter production? <clears throat> like all my answers, it, it, it depends. Um, <laughs> Many films, you know, uh, I don't think this is giving any way. Graphic films, I was a graphic films for a long time, and um, George and Paul would, and, and Sean, still. They would go out and shoot stuff, you know. These, George Casey used to present this volcano footage at these f conferences over and over until the film got finished, until the film got financed. So, you know, th there's different ways of doing it. You know, people will, used to be, you grab a camera and shoot some event that was kind of a, anchor point for the film, you know, a major event, a major, you know, a, a major tornadic event, you know, for example, that's something that you can use to sell the film with. I mean, typically people don't start go, really going to production production until the film is fully financed or, you know, and, and th until there's enough money, because not, look, in terms of your investors, investors don't want to put money in until they know that they're going to get the money back out, right? So, uh, in other words, if, if you get a third of your production budget and you spend it all and you can't finish the movie, that money is in the toilet. It'll never get back to your investors. So that's, that's the, the thinking. If you're, if you're kind of, um, if you're able to self-finance a portion of your project that's going to act as kind of a proof of concept or a sizzle reel or whatever, that's kind of a different deal. Yeah, I would say, you know, there's definitely specific instances, you know, Tornado Alley being one of them where Sean owned, or his dad at the time, owned a, a, an IMAX camera, and he could go out and shoot a bunch of, you know, reels of film until he got enough that was appropriate for the film and then get it financed. Now, that's a very specific situation that I don't know how many other people have, um, but you know, of course, the more you can self-finance to show, like Greg said, the proof of your concept or the proof of your visuals, the better. You're not, you're not going to be at a disadvantage the more you are able to bring to the table stuff that's already shot. Um, we, uh, we saw in the sample budgets um, that even in a, a natively shot 3D project, uh, there's still a certain percentage that's going to be put through a conversion. Um, and from seeing the content over the, the past few days, the quality of the conversion work in the projects ranges from acceptable to just downright wrong. And uh, I was wondering how you determine what determinations you have for balancing cost to conversion quality. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, it's a philosophical conversation, you know. I mean, look, if, if we could afford to shoot, um, if in those set of assumption parameters I say, can we shoot with the Salido camera? If we can fit the Salido camera in the place, can we afford to shoot with the Salido camera? Great. That's fantastic. What other camera? You know, that's an incredible piece of gear, right? But I will say that um, I have seen, and I don't know what you've seen, but I've seen uh, 3D conversion material just recently, in fact, a month ago, that was uh, 
I was just stunned by the level of quality that's coming out of, I mean, uh, I'm talking about, these are primarily Hollywood films that are. Oh yeah, no, I, I agree. No, conversion can be done really, really well. Yeah. Uh, I just fear that often producers go with the lowest bid and. Uh, well, it also depends on what you're filming. It, it, there's some subject matter that's really hard to film in native 3D. Sure. Because oh, and I, I'm not, I'm not asking native versus converted. I'm asking. Mm quality conversion where the 3D is acceptable to conversion work where you're seeing doubled edges and things at the wrong depths. And there was quite a lot of that in what we were seeing over the last two days. I didn't work on the movies that you're talking about. <laughs> so I can't really talk to you about why they made those decisions. I can say that you know I'm, I'm just, every movie I'm that I've ever worked on where there's a crummy 3D shot, you know, there's a lot of hand wringing. You know, I mean, sure, it sure. needs to get fixed. You know, sometimes it's because you, one of your eyes went out during the shot, and then you. you but, but I, I've never been involved where you know I, I've seen a lot of time and money go into trying to fix those problems. And sometimes, I, I mean, I, there's there's people here who could speak to this better than I can. No, no, but, no. but like, why it doesn't work? It's not necessarily because they were cheap. Mm. It's not not necessarily. You know, sometimes you spend money and it still doesn't work. And sometimes you need a story point. You know, this shot needs to be in the movie. It needs to. There's not another version of this. We need to have this shot in the movie. Okay, it's not the best quality. But I, again, I didn't work on right, this movie. Right. So, sorry. I, I, I guess what I, what I was asking was how important is it from the production standpoint to have the highest quality conversion work? Incredibly important. Yeah. I think it's extremely important. Yeah. I mean, because, because I wasn't seeing very much of that over the last two days. If you were seeing converted work I bet you that those shots that you saw that were converted that were working properly that you didn't know were converted. Uh, I, I, my field is, I'm a 3D expert, so I'm actually, I do a lot of quality control for 3D, and there are a lot, just a lot of things that I saw that, that I would call stereo errors that I wouldn't have let pass. And that, for when you are specifically going to do a, a giant screen film, you'll bring that expertise, and that will be something that you probably won't have as a challenge because that's your expertise, I would right, imagine. Right. I guess it's just just hearing like the discussion about resolutions and, and how GoPro could be used for an insert but wouldn't be used for anything substantial. Does that same kind of consideration go into the stereo? Um, I, I I do stereo conversion, of course. And <laughs> there, there's essentially, part of the problem is the, the, the feature world has essentially adopted a, a, a method of doing 3D conversion that only leads up to a certain quality level and doesn't go beyond that, and that for cost and, and time reasons. And that's leaking into the visual, into the large format world too, which has generally tried to do things a little better. Is that all? Thank you. I'd like to talk about dome customization. I'm wondering what advice you have for new producers to the meeting, especially uh, tasks that you should be thinking about, the, the appropriate budget for it, both in live production and in post. I can speak to it as it pertains to SOAR, and that is, you know, we have one of our producers who is constantly, which is Rick, who is constantly thinking of how to make this dome appropriate. He's thinking of the way it's framed. He's thinking of the way it's shot in general. And so I think if you're a new producer, you should, like we talked about generally, find someone who has expertise in making it appropriate for dome so you're not uh, going too far down the road without thinking of that because it is so important and it's been a primary focus for us in SOAR to make sure that we always keep that in mind. Do you have a rule of thumb percentage of the budget that you set aside for dome customization? I would say it's, you know, this is a specific situation because Rick inherently brings that knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I think if you are working with someone who doesn't have that knowledge, I don't know what the percentage <coughs> would be, but it would definitely be a good use of money and a budget for a new filmmaker, I would think to find someone that you're hiring as a consultant or in some capacity to help you keep that in mind or else you're going to waste a lot of your footage, I think, because it won't translate. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, I, I would say that I, uh, there is not a percentage of the budget. Um, you know, it used to be like a graphic, you know, they, they made films specifically for the dome uh, at one point, and, and then that was a, an ongoing constant, you know, it's a struggle. The dome is a cruel mistress, right? You know, if you're a filmmaker, if you're a cameraman, it's a, it's a bear, and it's a real bear if you're working with cameras who haven't done it. The, I think the, the main thing is, okay, I'm gonna have to tell a story to illustrate my point. So I was just working on a project with uh, a very, very famous cameraman, um, and he had never shot for the dome. He's a featured DP, and I mean, you know, world-renowned guy. But he very quickly realized that he was, he said, he was very uneasy about the frame. That was how he said it. And he was right to be. Um, because unless you've shot for it, the dome and failed, you haven't experienced the agony of your shot looking like, <laughs> looking terrible. <laughs> you know? And if you've seen your shot looking terrible as a DP, you have, because DPs have egos like we all do. DPs and directors, they, rec they want their stuff to look good and they think that what they're shooting is fantastic. And when they see it on the dome and the sky is too hot and it just blows out and all the blacks are gray, everyone feels it. And then they say, oh, now I feel it. <laughs> and they change their behavior. And until, until because, I, mean, I know it sounds silly, but it, it requires that kind of pain. <laughs> so I, my own feeling is that you have, to, you, have to, you have to have shot for it, or you have to be with somebody who's experienced the pain. You have to have been burnt. So my, my only advice is, hire somebody who's been burnt. <laughs> it sounds like a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I, I reformatted a, a film that was shot in 35mm. Um, you know, the Forber 35mm, we blew up to IMAX and were quite successful, and they wanted a dome version. And we did a dome version for that producer for a little under $100,000 that kind of cleaned up a lot of the problems. Wow. Went through the show and cleaned up a lot of the problems. <coughs> that was a film that was already uh, in the digital demand at that point. Right? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah, so it's was essentially was another, ver another deliverable version of it that we went through and, and did a lot of work on to, to reformat it to, so that the giraffe's heads weren't off the back of the screen and things like that. I, I would say that 100,000 is, uh, is a little bit of a lean number for what I would anticipate. This was for a major producer? I, no, no, I, 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 I'm not saying that, look, uh, you know, I'm just saying, my, uh, sure. <laughs> and, uh, but again, I don't know how much, you, one has to make assumptions now about how many shots in the movie have problems and how much you have to do to each of those shots, you know, so. That was too deep, of course. Um, <clears throat> if if uh, there was a uh, 70, I mean, a 1920 by 1080 piece of film that I absolutely have to use in my IMAX film, mm -hmm. will it be okay to put that in there and then just put a background behind it, you know, like they do? Yes. And it'll still look good, yeah. right? Yeah. There's a lot of examples of panels in films. Yeah. Uh, and there's examples in Greg's film today, the panels, shots, and... Uh, That's right. I have one more thing to say now. <laughs> uh, I found this out by accident, man. I was at, um, uh, at a movie theater, and I went like this, and as I was looking at the screen, it looked in 3D. So here's what I found out. If, you put, if you're looking at uh, your TV set or a movie theater, 2D picture, and you put your hand over your right eye or your left eye, keep both eyes open, and you look at the screen, you're going to see 3D. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay, I don't see any. I see people trying this out there, too. Um, okay. So <laughs> I don't see any other people with questions, so we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here a little bit early. Thank you very much to Greg and Jen for a wonderful discussion. And uh, we're going to wait for lunch at 1. The, the lunch is right behind us, uh, and then we're going to resume in this room at 3. And I, I actually wanted to make one quick, one quick point to this group. Um, just in, in summary, when I, when I think about the things that they were just talking about, pre-production in our industry is so critical. You have to think about all of these things in advance. If you are going to do a 3D conversion, 
Think about finding the right experts at the beginning of the process to make a dome version. You have to talk to experts first. Pre-production, you cannot leave all of this to the very end of the process. You have to plan for it, you have to budget for it, and you have to find experts to help you. And we all do our best to do that, but it's, it, it is probably never more important in any filmmaking or television, any industry I've ever worked in, giant screen requires really intense post-pre-production. So it informs all the rest of the process. So don't leave this to the end. This is probably the most important step of making a successful giant screen film. So lunch, and then we'll be back here at 3. Thank you.